Throughout history, we remember men and women for the great achievements and successes they had during their lifetimes. But sometimes, every once in a while, we remember someone for their failures. Samuel Taylor Coleridge is one of those people. Samuel Taylor Coleridge was born in 1772, the youngest of ten children. At the ripe old age of three, he was enrolled at Dame Key's Reading School. He bopped around between a couple other schools before he finally enrolled in Cambridge University in 1791. And that, my friends, is where the failing begins. In 1793, two years after starting college, Coleridge decided to enlist in the Army. Fun fact, he used the alias Silas Tompkin Cumberbatch. Hmm, kind of sounds like Cumberbatch. Anywho, Coleridge turned out to be an absolutely terrible soldier. So bad, in fact, his family paid to have him taken out of the army. It begs the question, how bad a soldier do you have to be before your family pays their hard-earned cash to pull you out? Hmm. After Coleridge was pulled out of the army, he returned to college. However, in 1794, he decided to drop out, without a degree, and start this thing called the Pantisocracy with his pal Robert Southey. And no, the Pantisocracy was not a democracy that centered around pants. Although, if you think about it, most democracies throughout history have been primarily run by men, who are more associated with pants than women are. Hmm. Anywho, the Pantisocracy was this utopian society Coleridge and some of his friends were going to start in the United States of America. However, they made this rule where everyone involved in the Pantisocracy had to be married. Coleridge wasn't married yet. But Robert had found this great gal, and she just happened to have a sister. So, Robert was all like, Coleridge, my dear friend, my beloved Elith just happens to have a sister, and she is quite the looker. So, Coleridge married Sarah Fricker in 1795, a marriage based solely on the Pantisocracy. And, guess what happens to that? That's right, it totally falls apart! No Pantisocracy for Coleridge or America. Bummer. But, the Pantisocracy wasn't where Coleridge's passion was anyways. Now, he was a man of words, so he wrote. In 1798, Coleridge and his bestest buddy, William Wordsworth, published Lyrical Ballads, a collection of poems. Now, Coleridge only had five poems in the book, but one of them was The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, which was actually based on a dream a friend of his had. And just so you know, that poem, some weird stuff, man weird. But it's usually grouped among his more important writings. Now the funny thing is, William didn't really like this poem. When Coleridge wrote it, he used a bunch of old words and spellings that nobody used anymore, and William believed that that made the poem hard to understand and therefore hurt the sales of the entire collection. Now, if that's what Coleridge's bestest friend in the entire world thought, what do you think people who didn't know Coleridge thought of it? Did you read the new poem by Samuel Taylor Coleridge? Oh yes I did, but I must admit, I could hardly understand a word of it. Quite right, quite right. And it gave me the heebie-jeebies. Coleridge revised the poem for subsequent editions, taking a lot of William's advice. But Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner wasn't Coleridge's greatest poetic failure. No, that came later, in 1816. A little backstory. By this point in his life, Coleridge had been suffering from some chronic pain. So, as was the custom of the time, he was prescribed an anodyne called laudanum. Now, laudanum was super addictive because it was opium dissolved in alcohol. Yeah, drugs and alcohol. Not a good combination in retrospect, but hindsight is 20-20. I digress. Anywho, at some point during the fall of 1797, Coleridge drank himself some laudanum and got pretty stoned. In his alcohol-slash-drug-induced stupor, he had this crazy dream. 
in which he saw himself composing two to three hundred lines of this incredible poem. And when he woke up, he could remember all of it. He could remember every word his dream self had written down. So, what did he do? Well, he decided to go do some needlepoint. No! He wrote it down! He started scribbling like a madman, getting all those wonderful words onto paper. Because when you're a writer, and a poem practically writes itself, you don't just let it go. <sighs> Come on. Needlepoint. Really. Now, Coleridge got to line 54 of this poem. And drunk the milk of paradise. And enter the man from Porlock. Now, we don't know a whole lot about this guy. Except that he was a man. From Porlock. And Coleridge ended up hating his guts. Because this man from Porlock came knocking on his door at line 54. And Coleridge, instead of ignoring the knock, decided to go and answer it. This man from Porlock detained Coleridge for over an hour on business. What kind of business is more important than finishing a poem? Needless to say, when Coleridge finally got to return to his writing, he had forgotten the rest of his dream. He could remember a few vague things, but not enough to continue writing. It was just... poof. Gone. <laughs> so, what did Coleridge do with his unfinished poem? Well, in 1816, he was persuaded to publish it with the title Kublai Khan, or A Vision and a Dream, A Fragment. Now, here's the funny part of this story. Whenever people think of Samuel Taylor Coleridge, if they know any of his poems, they probably know Kublai Khan. I mean, it's one of the poems you can recite in high school for poetry out loud. But why? It's a fragment. It doesn't make any sense, and Coleridge was totally high when he wrote it. Is that the message we want to send to high school kids? That getting high leads to good poetry? I don't think so. But Kublai Khan is THE Coleridge poem. And personally, I think it's THE Coleridge poem because it kind of describes his life in a nutshell. I mean, it starts off really, really great, and then it just stops. He never finishes it. It will forever remain a fragment. And that's kind of like everything else Corridge ever did. I mean, he started school but dropped out. He enlisted in the army but was pulled out by his family. He started the Pantasocracy but that totally fell apart. And he married Sarah Fricker but their marriage ended with the two of them separated and probably avoiding each other as much as possible. But that's just how Corridge was. He was a brilliant man, but he never quite lived up to his potential. And he realized that. He knew that he was never going to be as good as he could be. Or even as good as he wanted to be. But that never stopped him from trying. That never stopped him from trying, and then failing, and then trying harder, and then feeling better. No matter how many times life knocked him down, Cord always got right back up. So. With all that being said, I guess there's two things we can learn from Coleridge's life. First, don't do drugs, kitties. Bad things happen. Just say no. Second, no matter how many times you fail, never give up. Because someday, you might fail so spectacularly, history can't help but remember you. What do you mean that's not inspirational? I'm not trying to inspire people, I'm telling them how it is.